Good afternoon, everyone, slash good evening, and early or late afternoon. Late, late afternoon, early evening. And well, the time is time is funny at the moment. We're broadcasting from Elstree. From Bournemouth, yeah, from Elstree Studios. From Elstree Studios today. On-site childcare, it's how, we, it's how we roll. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And okay. so um, the plan for this evening is for a, to have a programme called Seeing is Believing, which um, is kicking off our uh, High Holy Day programming over the next couple of weeks as we go into our High Holy Days, which might be very different from what we've experienced in the past, but maybe also quite quite similar somehow. Um, and so Seeing is Believing is in two parts this afternoon, evening, whatever, which is that first, um, Shoshana and I thought it might be really helpful to have a conversation, um, which we share with you, where we're going to be learning a little bit together, thinking a little bit together, mm. reflecting on some bits and pieces together, and uh, trying to prepare ourselves for the upcoming days. After that, we'll have, at the end of that, we'll have a, a brief sort of five minute comfort break, and then we are going to be delighted and um, so welcome Ben Levy, our, um, who'll perform some on-screen magic. And mind reading. And mind reading through the computer screen. So, That's right. Um, the, per the perfect act for nowadays, social distancing, everything on Zoom experience. So um, we thought that the a good format for today would be um, for the rabbi and myself to start a conversation about, about Rosh Hashanah, about um, possibly how this year is different, how we can resonate with Russia. How is this year a... different from other years? I think you're a wrong festival, Are you sure? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and and hopefully there'll be some nuggets for, for everyone, including ourselves. Um, right. We've tried to start this conversation earlier today a few times, yeah. and already uh, a lot of interesting um, thoughts have presented. The truth is, this is just an excuse for us to talk to each other. I know, I yeah, know, but... it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> don't get to talk to each other this is this is great so um i think the first thing that we we thought we might kind of consider together is the how last year rosh hashanah had been which was our first rosh hashanah with barnet and then sort of where we expected this year to be you know as in sort of 10 months ago what the conversations that we were having towards the end of the young towards the end of our holidays yeah, yeah sort of uh 
all the different feedback we've got yeah and then what we thought we might which was all over the place you know and then, and then we thought how are we gonna how are we gonna take this to the next year and build on it and sort of work on the challenges and improve on the strengths and yeah you know and, and then something else happened in the middle but but at least what what you know what do you remember of, of what we had first, first thought of and how our first Rosh Hashanah with Barnet had gone yeah um I remember we came in all guns blazing and um that was that was a scary place that was an exciting but also a scary place to be for yeah. us. and then you mentioned you know 10 months ago post you know, post that high of the Yom Narayan where we were receiving feedback, overwhelmingly, incredibly positive, but, you know, some also a bit iffy, like, you know, is this the way we want our services to look? Yeah. And what struck me as a little bit, um, I wouldn't say ironic, but um, interesting thought was that this year, all shuls are being forced to offer so many different types of alternative services mm. and to have already experienced offering that kind of slightly not quite the norm service maybe puts us... Um, um, a little bit ahead of the game in that, you know, we already have, we, we've experienced that people, people showed how open they are to it. So I yeah, think, yeah. I think that's quite a positive one. But um, I think that is. Um, just, well, I'm just wondering, by the way, can everyone hear both of us okay? If you just nod, if you all can hear both of us, you can't hear both of us okay. It's Sorry. very quiet. Very, very quiet. quiet. Okay. We're going to try and Sorry, get... we'll move closer to the screen. Okay. <clears throat> Vernon, when you shout, if you can't hear us. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Good. It's okay. a bit better, but I'm actually going to we can plug plugging in the speak. Okay. okay. All right. Is anyone else having problems hearing? No, it's okay. No. No. Fine. So um, I think you're right, and I think that um, what was interesting about last year is is you know when you first come to a community, I suppose there are different ways that you could start to immerse yourself amongst amongst your new congregation and, and and one of the ways might be well sort of just let things be as they used to be for a while and then slowly slowly kind of make a change here and make a tweak there or, or you could sort of as you say going all, all guns blazing sort of almost like laying out your market stool as to what what you stand for and, and and that could be on the one hand quite fortuitous in that you are really setting some sort of vision and some groundwork for the future but on the other hand quite quite tricky because as you say that you know there are changes and, 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 ch and any change, even if it's positive change, change is just tough for any of us. Um, you know, we've been finding that recently, just constant changes throughout the past few months. Some of them very positive, some of them really helpful, but change is change, change is uh, unsettling. So, so I think that, yeah, we plan to sort of pull back, think about the things that have worked, things that about the things that we could have kind of improved upon, and then try and take the message, which is let's have a Rosh Hashanah, which is entirely engaged, entirely connected, entirely meaningful, whereby the prayers are not just something we have to get through, right. but rather they are something which which are which is uplifting, which which makes us feel on fire, which makes us feel like there's a being that we're connecting to, and there's a there's a self that we're connecting to, there's there's an other people that we're connecting to. That all of that could be once again um, felt in Barnet this this year i suppose i hope that with what we're doing this year we're not gonna lose out on that aim even if it's gonna look quite different yeah um can you hear us by the way yeah you can hear us it just seems like a bit iffy um the other thing we could do is we could change the speaker uh, i'm not sure why it's not picking up our set where's the sound are we blocking the sound goes right? in there Oh, okay. It's okay? Is okay, it all fine, right? Okay. Fine, fine. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a different year, and uh, we're hoping not to lose the momentum that we, um, or for anyone to lose any momentum that might they might individually have or that we started last year. Um, hmm. And then something happened, and then, well... Yeah, I don't like this. You don't like this. <laughs> I don't like, we were having a conversation earlier today and um, just trying to figure out, or uh, figure out how, how we, <laughs> how, um, what, how we might discuss this this evening. And, and Samuel says to me, well, you know, what with Corona, I said, mm, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that we need to, that Corona needs to be you know, at the foresight, I'm a little bit forefront at the at the, at the forefront because I'm a little bit um, 
it sounds ridiculous. I'm a bit bored of Corona. I don't like that that it has to be the cloud hanging over Rosh Hashanah. I think Rosh in my head, Rosh Hashanah is Rosh Hashanah is Rosh Hashanah. And we had it last year. We'll have it this year. We'll have it again next year. And every single year, ad infinitum until, you know, Mashiach comes. But like Rosh Hashanah is going to be regardless of whether there's the suffocation of Corona. So I don't think that having the emphasis or, you know, what we've had to do to make Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, despite Corona, I think, I, I don't think that's necessarily a positive starting point. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose I, I, I heard what you had to say, and I, and I thought that was really powerful, because on the one hand, you know, you hear stories, say, about Pesach Seder in the Warsaw Ghetto, yeah. Pesach Seder in, the, in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, you know, whereby, did it matter? where they were, what suffering they were enduring, Pesach say that in the Spanish Inquisition, whatever, Rosh Hashanah, you know, it, it, did it matter? Did it matter? I mean, undoubtedly, they were feeling something because of what was going on around them. But at the same time, there was this anchor in time, which maybe transcended, transcended that moment, transcended that unique suffering and said, we need to eat matzah, you know, like, we need to say the Haggadah. We need to blow shofar. These are they just that's what we do because it's Rosh Hashanah, because it's Pesach. So you know in a way, separating ourselves out from what's happening around us to just experience Rosh Hashanah as Rosh Hashanah. And obviously where the way we do that will be affected somewhat by by the circumstances, but it doesn't need to be totally affected. Right. At its essence, it's still Rosh Hashanah, just like at its essence. People still sat around the Seder table, told the story of, you know, of, of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, ate their matzah, and read the Haggadah. Like, I just, I feel, I feel it's quite suffocating to just the burden of Corona all the time. So I don't, I, I felt that maybe this evening, it doesn't need to be the main focus. Um, yeah, but at the same time, that's what we all sort of, there's a lot of anxiety around it. And I, I had a real anxiety this week because on Tuesday night, I think I was looking at the news for the last time before bed. And then it, I think it was at 10.30 p.m. or something. And it said, oh, we're going to have another lockdown, essentially. You know, uh, we're going to be limited to <laughs> groups of six. And pubs and restaurants are going to be limited to groups of six. And he's like, sod it. All of this time all we th put into, you know, the logistics of all these services. Yeah. And it's all gone to pot. Yeah. Um, sod and pot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, so, <of> my life. <laughs> so it, 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 no, it was like, it was like what's going to be? Because what is going to happen? This this doesn't seem like Rosh Hashanah's like Rosh Hashanah's just got cancelled. That's what we said to each other. Um, no, no, excuse me. I think you'll find I said no such thing. I think you felt um, an incredible amount of anxiety and and helplessness because you and the office staff and, and people from the community have put so much effort into creating a means for everyone to experience Rosh Hashanah, you know, within, to, to whatever extent, and yeah. to all of that. And it was just see, seeing that kind of come cr crashing down. It's like, oh, well, you know, there might as well not be a Rosh Hashanah, to which, you know, that's how you went to sleep with that on your mind. And uh, Yeah, and actually, in a way, that was kind of my first real, like, really getting affected by Corona. And then actually, then that, that continued because the day later, I got a call from someone in our shul that, that her husband's unwell with it in a hospital and that she's got it. And then that 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 just brought everything back home yeah. again. You know, like it was almost like Barnett had got through this and now we were on our way out. And now it's rearing its and head now it's, again. Yeah, yeah, and it's coming back again. So, so you know, and I think that's something, but on the other hand, you know, we, while we were all going through this experience of Corona, what, what sometimes I think we can fall into the trap of is, is then thinking that we're all kind of experiencing it in the same way, although it's all, for everyone it's it's entirely negative, which I don't think it necessarily is. Correct. And also that that also means in certain years people will be coming to Rosh Hashanah with their own personal pain, as their own personal difficulties that we're not aware of, and just because we're all sort of we're all in this together, we're all having some level of, of personal difficulty, that doesn't mean that any other any, year. any other year yeah. someone else hasn't had a bereavement, hasn't had a job loss, hasn't had a just some sort of trauma, whatever it is, has made their Rosh Hashanah a different Rosh Hashanah. So I, I think it's really interesting to think about, as you say, that sort of how much does this year, why is this year different from all other years? 
how much does that influence Rosh Hashanah or how much does Rosh Hashanah stay as our eternal day of return, of repentance, of coming close to Hashem? Yeah, and I, I think it's, it's that each person discovering or, or uh, yeah, finding out how they can make that day, how that we can make Rosh Hashanah that day of return, that day of, um, I think about recalibrating myself to, you know, my Jewish New Year, I think of, about it as a sort of coming home experience. Um, and, you know, how, how people, how we can all achieve that. Right, right. And I suppose that's where, that's what teshuvah really means. That's what repentance, the Hebrew word teshuvah really means. It comes from the word shav or shuv, which means to return. There's a certain sense of, of returning. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, even to like Shabbat, to, 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 to dwell somewhere. But there's a certain sense of coming home, of homecoming, of return, which I think is really powerful that whatever journey, wherever, wherever we've gone in this year, wherever, you know, life has taken us because life has taken us all on a real journey there's a purity inside a place of our unscathed unhurt self that pure piece of soul inside that, that can be reconnected with um throughout the grind through all the pain through all the uh, yeah through all the all stuff the all, yeah all the, all the <laughs> chaff all the mark that, that has happened this year that has just got in the way that has got in the way of our headspace, in the way of our family space, in the way of our workspace. You know, what is space? Now space is two meters. Everything is now in two meters. Um, so I think return is really powerful. I so that that's something that I remember we spoke about a couple of years back when I um so that something that we spoke a couple of years back when I just not picking up. Is the microphone picking me up? Um, when when we were in Israel, and for the first time since we were married, um, I had a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur experience that made me feel that coming home. And I didn't actually have that word for it. Um, what had happened is we'd had um, Ezra was born, and um, and I was looking for a place to daven for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and I had I'd left it last minute because he was a baby, and I I didn't think oh no I was pregnant. I beg your pardon, I was pregnant with Ezra. And I didn't have anywhere to govern that I felt I was comfortable governing. The shul situations in Israel are very different. It's like a very, generally, it's quite male centric in the kinds of communities that we moved around. Yeah, but there were also, I was helping out in a shul which was a very different flavor to the one that you sort of. Right, it was a very. Like. Kalabach. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was a certain flavor and a certain type, and it was beautiful in its own. Way, and while Yisrael enjoyed it, it, it wasn't for you. It wasn't yeah. for me. And um, I just last minute i just rocked up you know nine months pregnant well no like seven months you pregnant. Were, you i know right. he was due mid-november right. seven months pregnant and i ended up standing for the full days of rosh hashanah and for yom kippur outside a shul that used that was a safari shul so for the first time since i married you yeah. i experienced my the tunes and the kind of community and the culture of my upbringing and and i remember coming home after that and just on this high because all of those tunes were there and I'd spent the entire day like just totally connecting in a way that I hadn't for many, many years. Right. Rosh Hashanah to me had become a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a chore, but something where particularly when, you know, we were doing community work so often there's that sense of I need to be on, on yeah. for that day. And, and there's something beautiful about that also, but that kind of um, detracts a little bit from, from one's own. Well, cause you're, you're not, only thinking this sometimes sometimes you're not only thinking about my prayers to god you're thinking about my prayers to god in the context of standing at the front of the shoulder or standing at the front of the ladies section and people looking at you right and running a service that or even a small breakout groups or whatever it is it was the first time in many years that i'd had an experience that was just for myself right and i came home on this high and i said you know it was like it was like it was like being at home again and you said something that i remember and you said well, that's what teshuva is. It's coming home. And that really resonated with me because that's the sense, I suppose, that I get every Rosh Hashanah, whether I'm connecting to the prayers or not. And let's face it, not every year I have that, you know, that spiritual experience. I'm not able to tap into that every year, but every year I still have the sense of the new year and it's coming home. And it's sort of like a recalibrating myself and like starting again. And like, it's yeah. a really... I don't, I don't know if cleansing, because that sounds quite Catholic, but it, it's a bit, it, it's quite a, it's a releasing feeling. And I don't think that needs to be done. That, for me, that wasn't 
in a shawl that was standing outside in an alleyway by the window of but a shawl that sang the, the tune the sounds of your youth yeah. of my childhood yeah. and my grand I, I just you know summon these pictures of my grandfather leading the services in the Indian Iraqi shawl that we used to go to in Australia and and that was that sense of coming home right and I I, I um just thinking about that point that you made about the pressure of also being on show so I think that there's a great sort of story where there's um a relatively new and young Rebbe who is uh, in his study. This is not you. What do you mean? It's not me, no. Not you. And, uh, <laughs> he got a beard for it. He's a Rebbe. <laughs> he needs a bit longer. Anyway, so... Uh, a bit longer. A bit longer. So, uh, and whiter. Anyway, so the point... So, so he's, he's there and he's in his study and he hears sort of like a, a scuffling around, by, by the back of the door and he thinks that some of the Hasidim, some of his followers have come to sort of sneak a peek at the Grand Master and watch what he's doing. So he starts praying fervently because, because he thinks that, you know, or with greater fervor because he thinks that that's what's expected of him. And then he, after a while, he opens the door and he sees there's just a cat rustling around outside. <laughs> and so, so, he's, so, 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 so the comment from the, the actual Rebbe about this person was, you see, he dubbins to a cat. So, um, you know, he, he prays to a cat, he doesn't pray to God. He's just he's praying for the admiration of others. And so I often feel, feel like uh, I'm praying to a cat when I'm standing, so to speak, when I'm standing at the front of the shul. Um, and, and there's this sense of, do I, if every, is every movement not just being processed in terms of how I'm relating to Hashem, but also how others are watching me relate to Hashem? You know, and I think that's an interesting one about being on show when it comes to intense spiritual experiences. How, how is that possible? Um, you know, the, the observer effect, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but also when you first came to England and we started our community work oh, now 10 you, years ago. Don't, don't, you don't need to say And I was our first Rosh Hashanah. And, <laughs> and, 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 um, and it, you know, you were, you were struggling through the Ashkenazi tunes, but then we finally got to the finale, the finale of the High Holy Days. And you, uh, you really, you couldn't manage it anymore because we concluded with yes, God. But as soon as it went like bomb bomb, you, I think you, you, cracked, burst out you burst out laughing. laughing, like you couldn't you couldn't manage it. It's so different from the Sephardi tunes of your youth. And I think that's so important to think about that this Rosh Hashanah, when we might be having entirely different Rosh Hashanah experiences. So though we can I think we can go back to the heart of what is our where is our heart in Rosh Hashanah? When you close when we close our eyes and we think about, you know, what does Rosh Hashanah really mean to us? What are the formative Rosh Hashanah experiences, maybe from childhood, maybe from a later point in life when we reconnect or connected for the first time to Judaism? You know, what are those formative Rosh Hashanah experiences? Because those are the ones that are going to have to inform us this Rosh Hashanah, because I think this Rosh Hashanah, we are going to be more alone than at other times. Even on a basic level that sh normally you can come to shul for like five hours right and the maximum service length is what is it's two hours in the yeah. morning and uh book your tickets by the way booked out they're not well, no, that one's not that one's not <laughs> that one's not um, no one wants to come for two hours <laughs> and then there's, there's, there's i mean there's minimum there's mario but but it's yeah. there's a lot more time of independent rosh hashanah i suppose you know we've just we've just um said our stories of feeling on on show but i don't I, i'm actually wondering whether this isn't just exclusive to, to rabbinic couples or chazanim or something I, I, it, to an extent i feel that everybody is um everyone is party to that we come to shul and there is a little bit of show for everyone even before i was in a community position and that time i went to the, the first my first united synagogue experience or my first ashkenazi experience where I was saying the Amida and in my Sephardi shul growing up we used to stop during the Amida as a private personal Amida and wait for the shofar blast and I waited and waited and it didn't come and I just thought wow everyone here davens with so much kavana with so much intensity and 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 feeling that that I'm just way ahead and then while I'm waiting for the chauffeur blast, like 20 minutes later, they start the repetition and I realize they don't blow the chauffeur during the silent Amida, the personal silent Amida. And I felt embarrassed thinking everyone's looking at me, thinking I'm struggling through all the words. But that was before I had any kind of um, community role that anyone was really watching me as a Rebison or anything like that. So, I, I mean, I think that all of us, 
regardless of what our position is in a shul, whether yeah. we read Hebrew fluently or or whatever, that there's some kind of um, uh, mental process of people are watching me yeah. and I'm on show yeah. and um, and that maybe does again detract a tiny bit from what we can give to a davening. So maybe maybe in a way it would be enforced into at least some kind of private prayer in a private space. Yeah. Maybe there's something really positive about that. Yeah, actually, some people said to me during lockdown, they said actually they're finding they can daven easier at home, let's say with their family around them or not, maybe just going privately into the garden. Yeah. And, you know, they found that easier than having to go to shul however many times a day uh, and davening funny. in that way because because there's there is a time when you can get into your own personal space and conversation where you nothing has to be nothing else has to be taken into mind other than this these words and yeah. this relationship i think as a, as a as a woman also it's always been sort of drummed into me that you know if, if it's okay not to have the shawl experience so long as you carve out some time for you someone will be on with the children or whatever that is you carve out time for yourself and that's your meditation time that's your tefillah time and it's okay so maybe in a sense for some women having been um taught this for for many years I mean, or at least i was and i hope that many many other women also have been um it might be easier to to accept yeah that it might be that some men are feeling mm -hmm. it um, more of a pressure about not being able to get to shul for the you know the requisite five hours or whatever it is so that's right. a, maybe there are some feelings of guilt involved there as well but well, um we are jews after all yeah we are, and i think yeah. maybe it's just me that always feels guilt about everything but um I, the best the best piece of advice i ever had from from um a, a reverson a very a, a much older and very wise reverson was every rosh hashanah you know take take time to yourself at home before you go to shul mm. and say some some of the governing at home and I, th I think that applies to everybody yeah i suppose that maybe the advice for this here would be um even if we are going to shawl for a part of the time um whatever happens allow there to be times of private privacy and reflection at some point in the day and almost like schedule it in if there is a system around you if there's partners around you or or family you know everyone should know that like from 10 to 10 to 11 that's that's my time in the garden just to do some thinking about this new year that and then and then you know trade off so right. 10 to 11 is my time 11 to 12 is your time and and, and, and at 12 o'clock we'll have lunch um after shabbos uh yom tov meal. Well, you know that 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 then at least sets up in one's mind a plan which is quite specific right um if we just say i'll take an hour at some point it, it often doesn't, doesn't happen. happen yeah we have to smarten yeah smart enough but here comes smart, psychologist talking smart, smart plans smart plans <laughs> specific measurable achievable realistic and time bound so uh once we can get that then we could have at least some time for that so what time are you on what time am i on <laughs> well actually i think i'm on from 7 a.m at short or 2 p.m <laughs> with a little brief interlude whilst i'm looking after kids and you're doing the ladies service so right. um which maybe, means just let, which means that i'm on from 7 a.m Till 2 that's right with a little brief interlude. interlude yeah <laughs> 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 okay so um yeah so that's 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 yeah. that's the that's the advice that i would give for women who are how would I experience a, a, a lone Rosh Hashanah governing? Now, I've had experience doing that before, but never I've never kind of reached any heights, but what would you recommend? Yeah, that's a good question. And a part of me is thinking you could do some breathing exercises, you could download some guided mindfulness meditations just to sort of settle your mind. Pre-print off. Yeah, pre-print off. And I think over one of the overarching messages I think I'd like to share with people before Rosh Hashanah is something that my headmaster used to say. Um, and I just have like this strong image of, of David Levin, who was very proud of the fact that his grandfather was a yeshiva bocha, um, even though he himself- your headmaster. Uh, my headmaster, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, even though he himself um, I don't, he was not Jewish. Um, but um, I, I remember also, I came back to school once after going to yeshiva and I said, you know, to be honest, Mr. Levin, um, nothing I experienced in school or academia has ever challenged me to the extent that that Talmud study has challenged me like this 
this Talmud study is way above anything that I ever experienced here in, in, or, or in university. And he said, of course, of course. He said, why, why, what do you think has been keeping the Jews occupied for 2000 years? It's obviously incredibly deep and obviously incredibly complex. Um, and then he went off on about his, his grandfather, the yeshiva buffer. I mean, so, um, so he, his, his, in his strong South African accent, he used to say, failing to prepare is, is preparing, preparing to, to fail. fail. That's right. So, so I think, you know, um, some people might, I was worried that some people might experience me saying this as like, as us um, discharging our obligation by saying to the community, we, you need to prepare as well, but, but, um, DIY Rosh but, but in terms of a DIY Rosh Hashanah, then it could just be a Google search before Rosh Hashanah to find material that we, and print it out that we want to engage with on the day. So whether that is, you know, looking on Yeshiva University's website, yutorah.org. Well, the OU has a They've lot. got great printouts, the OU's got great printouts. Um, you should have, we got through our door on Shabbat. I don't know if anyone else got it through on Shabbat, but there was the uh, Shana Tova publication from the United Synagogue that that came out, which is quite substantive. Um, and that should have gone to every United Synagogue household to also provide some reading material. But then there's other stuff out there as LSJS well. Is LSJS, is, we've ever got LSJS stuff it's through, the, through the um, through the internet, uh, through the sorry, through, through, through the door. Yeah, th I think the layer has actually got it. But then we don't always open other people's mail unless it says LSJS. LSJS yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we've got actually there's stuff that comes into the house which is not Rabbi just Rabbi Robinson. No, Robert, and the Rosenstein's. <laughs> right. We got the Rosenstein's post. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> So uh, if anyone's <laughs> going to Bet Shemesh and wants to take an old like letter to the Rosensteins, yeah, um, or or Lincoln Square for that matter, yeah. Um, Lincoln Square. Wink Lincoln Square. Square. We don't say that. One. Yeah. Anyway, so um, well, so so we need to prepare, and and, and in terms of meditations, also. So I think that there, there's a lot of material line, and also or just Jewish spirituality in general. That's your thing. So then again. You type into the internet Jewish spirituality and other stuff that comes up on a Google search that isn't always um, part of our tradition. There may be parts, there might be new sort of uh, ways of thinking which are not consistent with Orthodox Judaism. But Why? Madonna told you. Madonna told you from the Kabbalah Center. That's fine. Um, but things like the Eon Center for Jewish Spirituality in New York. Eon or Eon? I U Y U N. And we can send around these links. Um, there's some very good material there. Um, but, but so in terms of but what I was thinking about, what, what, what should one do? If you have an hour on Rosh Hashanah, I was about to ask if you have an hour on Rosh Hashanah, um, the, what I would do is, and, and, and I'm influenced, as you know, quite a lot by um, Rav Nachman, is that I, I would just talk to God for an hour. I would just sit there and talk. And sometimes the words might not come. Sometimes it might take a while. Sometimes I might say, I haven't done this in a really long time. I don't even know what to say to you right now, but it's Rosh Hashanah and I just wish we could, we, I wish we could just say something to each other. You know, I wish, I wish we could, you could open my mouth and help me find the words that I've been wanting to say for the past six months, for the past eight months, for the past year, for the past two years, the past 10 years, whatever it is. But like, I really wish that you could help me have that open my heart, open my mouth. You know, we say at the beginning of every prayer, Every Amida, Hashem Fasai Tiftach, Ufi Agiti Razer, I shall open my mouth and my mouth will be able to tell of your praises. But open my mouth, it, it, sometimes it's difficult to speak. And actually, Rav Nachman says that even if if there's nothing you can say at all, sometimes it's worth just saying something, a, word, a, a little phrase like Ribono Shel Olam, which means master of the world. Or you can just say, God, 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 or Hashem, Hashem, and, and just say it until something. Sort of catches so he uses and that sinks as a meditation in. Aid. Well, I mean, it could you could look at that from the perspective of a mantra, like a mantra meditation, right. um, that you're starting to sink into a consciousness that allows me to expand myself a bit. You're saying that that you're saying that can be the end as well, that as not not the necessary think, means to an end. Yeah, I think just literally. He literally he just says you could sit there for an hour and just say, "Rabboni shalom, Rabboni shalom," just Hashem. Hashem, and that could be such a powerful hour. Um, and there's no, that is your time. That, that's the time that we set aside. There's no like, I think judging how well or how poorly we use it. We just, as long as we try and use it, I think that's, 
that's a good effort. It's making me think about, um, I don't know if you've thought about this in the last few years, but do you remember when we were living in Edgeware, we were first married or a couple of years during those first few, during those first couple of years that we were married. And um, so we went through some hard times with this and that. And, and there was a time when we used to walk up to the, up the at Edgeware Lane, we used to go to that bridge at the top of the farm that yeah. led from Edgeware to Elstree. Yeah. And it looks over the M25 and Yes. Do you, do you remember that? Yeah. And there was a time we used to stand there. Or well, the M1, I think. The M1. Yeah. Just multi-lane traffic. Yeah, yeah. And there was like tons. And everything would be drowned out by the traffic, even at sort of 11 p.m., 12 p.m. And we used to stand there and just scream over the traffic. And <laughs> you remember that? I remember. I remember. Um, <laughs> Sometimes I feel like on Rosh Hashanah that I don't have words, but I suppose Rebona Shalom is a, or God, God is, a, is an answer to that. In my head, I just kind of think about scream, just scream. But I suppose we can't do that in our gardens. Well, you could. The neighbors might the get neighbors, it. The neighbors, yeah. yeah. It's always worried about the ne- the onlookers. Once again, again, the cats, right? It's the cats. Well, I think that was that was that was the point of up there looking on top of the M1 with yeah. no one around, and yeah. just the stars, and yeah. you know there wasn't anyone there to judge or to say like, why are you screaming? And it was like we were doing that Yoko Ono like primal scream, primal thing? scream, primal scream yeah, yeah, like the was it the silent scream that painting? Oh yeah, Klimt. Yeah, no, not Klimt. is it a Klimt? I'm not sure. But you're taking away my sermon from day two. But oh, that's I'm okay. sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> I'm um, so sorry. <laughs> but what I was, what we shared in the car was one of the things that I found really powerful about Rosh Hashanah is, is the shofar because the shofar is like that wordless call, that wordless scream that almost beyond the processing of words is this sound that that doesn't have to be formed into any sort of um, logical, rational, conceptual form. It's yeah. just a call. It's just a call. It's 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 so deep and it's so primal. And when you blow the shofar, you know you're 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 you are projecting from your diaphragm all the way out, and it, it really does feel at times. And then there's the different calls of the shofar. You know, there's the long call, there's the short call, there's the broken call. But um, it does feel like very pre-verbal, very. Very, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's interesting because in the, in the Gemara it talks about the shofar as being a tefillah, it talks about shofar as being a prayer, and often when we think about prayer we think about words and words and words, that's all we think about because that's how we relate to prayer in shul, it's that, that, that there is a certain text that you have to say, and here when it, comes to the, yeah, when it comes to shofar we are praying without words. Um, it also makes me think, by the way, about people who don't have words. So uh, people whose only communication is through grunts or um, calls. Um, sobs. Sobs, yeah. That, that, that there's something quite just powerful about calling out in that way. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Caveman grunt. Caveman grunt. So back to... Um, using our time wisely and preparing wisely for this Rosh Hashanah, where there will be inevitably less time to be held in shul and more time to have to hold ourselves at home. So we spoke about getting the right material off the net in advance, the right yeah. reading materials, things that will set us up. What about creating the right Rosh Hashanah experiences and yeah. conversations at home? Yeah. Um... opening questions you mean that, that, could, that could yeah, yeah. What, what sort of conversations could we try and facilitate on Rosh Hashanah which might feel a bit artificial at times but that's okay that would help us get into that Rosh Hashanah feel I think again just paying homage to my um Sephardi roots when I was a kid we used to have um I thought everybody had a Seder on Rosh Hashanah because my family had a Seder and I'd say like, oh, how was your Rosh Hashanah Seder? And people would look at me like, what are you on about? And I only realized when I was a little bit older that having all of these Timanim was not the norm in Ashkenazi circles, but I think it's made a bit of a, like a bit of a comeback or not a comeback. It's, it's kind of, it's been introduced to Ashkenazi circles. So I think just as 
we have these talking points at the at the Seder on Pesach that we have um, we have these symbols on Rosh Hashanah also. And so I don't know so the, we... you're right. When I was growing up, so we didn't have a Seder. We the, so the Seder is these different symbolic foods like beetroot and carrot and fenugreek whatever fenugreek well, i don't is. think people used to have that 20 years ago i don't i don't know the only thing we had the apple and honey, the apple and honey right. dance curd, that's the thing we didn't have a safari growing up you had apple not... and sugar or you didn't have no we had we had like an apple compote but no okay. honey we don't eat honey on Rosh Hashanah. your dad doesn't like honey i don't like honey okay but that's not why okay he didn't kind of like veto honey <laughs> <laughs> no bees in this house <laughs> um no, but I, I think having those, I mean, yeah, so we've got all these symbols that, you know, the, the fenugreek and the beetroot and the beans that, and the, the gourd, the pumpkin, the leek. Don't um, forget your lamb's head. The lamb shank, yeah. Not the shank, head, the head. The, the head, head. Sorry, well, the lamb head or the fish head. Fish head, fish, fish head. head. Yeah. Um, so we, but those are, those are meant to be talking points also. So in the same way that we use these props at the Pesach Seder, we're kind of being given these props for Rosh Hashanah also. I think those that, you know, for people who don't usually have that, maybe this is a year to, to introduce having those props. So for example, if we were to use an like apple and honey, where we say, we say, may it be your will, Hashem, the king of the king of the our Lord and God of our, our forefathers, that you should renew for us a good and sweet year. So it might be a question like, well, for you, what would make this year good and sweet? Yeah. You know, what would be your threshold? What would be your metric of goodness and sweetness? Right. So yeah. just extending the question out yeah. to make it relevant. So that's a good one. Um, if, if you had another month of the previous year, what could you have done differently to improve the goodness and sweetness of 2020? I think that's already a long, complicated question. No, it's great. Mm. So, yeah. I don't know. I think you phrase things a little bit psychologically. Like, Sorry. That's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> I think if you had another month of 2020, yeah. what might you want to do with that month? It's right. Just, it's just a lot more simple. Not to, I think we know to make it a better year, but Fine. what would you do with an extra month? Yeah. Um, that's a good Should one. Should you tell me if I, maybe we'll go to our Lord and go to our forefathers? So we should be like the head, not the tail, right? When we have the head on the table, right. we should be like the head, not the tail. So I think, I think also, I think a lot of people, you've just given me this, this idea that a lot of people, um, because they're not sort of set in stone, they're simanim, it's not a halacha, it's not a, these are just customs. It's just customs, yeah. So a lot of people make up their own yihirat zone. So some families will, you know, go out and find a yihirat zone. So I'm now going to try and, using word plays, I'm sure Richard Carlo could probably ace this, but like, finding an item or a food or whatever to incorporate in on the right. on the Rosh Hashanah table and say and, and make a link right between I'm like totally lost now but um think of a food cake a food. cake okay obviously okay Ra I hope raisin raisin cake, biscuits. Raisin, I hope I hope the mud doesn't cake on you I don't just using word plays uh, um right and then maybe that's a family, yeah. you know, a family activity to do, right. particularly with um, teenagers. Like Rosh Hashanah dingbats. Yeah. Ding that's it. That's, that's only, I don't know why I said teenagers. We all enjoy a good dingbat. Yeah. Do you enjoy a good dingbat? <laughs> I'm no good at dingbats. You know that. Um, but I think yeah. also those conversations that don't have to, they don't have to necessarily be wedded to a particular food item. It doesn't have to be the beetroot becomes oh, a meal, yeah. talking point, but. But though, though there could be certain com um, buzz questions that are pre-prepared for a meal, yeah. just to open things up a bit. So um, in a sort of similar way to what I've said once or twice in the past on, uh, I think, one of our um, Wednesday well-being sessions, where uh, Dr. John Gottman talks about keeping relationships healthy by using love maps. So love maps are questions that allow a couple to have deep and possibly meaningful conversations well into their relationship because often we can fall away from remembering the fact that you know aside from all the business so to speak that we do together the housekeeping and if if, if sorry what housekeeping do we do together okay uh, and if, if possible if we're, oh, i'm working on it and if possible child rearing and or or parent caring or 
um, business running, whatever it is, apart from, you know, in terms of actual co, co, co workers. So um, apart from all that, there's actually a relationship that I that, that two people fell in love with each other because they liked each other, not because they liked all the other things that they do around each other. So he says he pre he prescribes love love maps, which are kind of powerful questions to ask, say, on a date, such as what's what's your current greatest unfulfilled dream? That's not necessarily a negative question. That's just a question about like, where are you at at the moment? Yeah. Um, um, what's your biggest what's your biggest hope? um for the next couple of weeks mm. like those are sort of questions that can allow a couple to reconnect on a very much more fundamental level so i think similarly you could have rosh hashanah maps yeah those sort of questions which um can open up thinking about what the new year what repentance means to you so so something like what was your biggest regret from this year and um what do you think was your biggest growth point this year and what was your biggest self-discovery or discovery of someone else um what was the time that you most felt connected to god or what was the time you most felt disconnected from god the sort of questions that allow us to really take stock of what roshan is about um what for you would it mean to come home you know we're talking about coming home and yeah. shiva what would it take and then what would it take to do that to achieve that yeah um those are the sorts of questions that could be had around a really extended Rosh Hashanah meal and why not because well, we're not, not not even necessarily around the meal yeah just, just the, in the Rosh garden Hashanah experience doesn't have to be no around the table. I just like sitting around food to be honest I know or cake I know apple and honey I know <laughs> raisin biscuits anyway go on yeah <laughs> yeah that's just nice but those those sort of questions I think could open open things up there's also avenues for connection between people in a household as well. It's right. not just, I mean, there's a sort of dual um, relationship going on there with, with God and also with people in the household. This might also be for all for all that many people have been sort of forced in a household together for so long, opening these avenues of communication, these conversations yeah. can also be, yeah, and almost, be quite normal. And almost having cards printed beforehand or, or things written down, yeah. almost forces us to have those conversations so, so you you know me and that i generally kick back against anything that seems artificial right but, but plan fun pla yeah you will have fun yeah um organized too or, much yeah yeah um but if it, but it actually it does create just a, a certain a sense format, of yeah. a format yeah. a formality to it which is okay yeah i've come to i've, I've learned to kind of appreciate that now it's been a while <laughs> um also with 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 Yitzha around with the children, I've in the last couple of years I've tried to make it a little bit more um, accessible to them. So, for example, rather than having a fish head that year, I just bought jellyfish, right, and sort of gave the kids jellyfish instead yeah. of a fish head because for them, as it, what's a fish head on the table? I mean, I remember the novelty of them being like absolutely intrigued by the eye and pulling out the eye. But um, my aunt eats the eye. I, I know your aunt eats lots of funny things, Samuel. Okay, yeah. I think we got given jellyfish by someone. We did. Max yeah. has given us some. We, we've we've eaten one packet we've already. We've eaten all the jellyfish. We've left. No, we, we haven't. We need more jellyfish for our Rosh Hashanah seder. We've got a packet left. Thank you, Michael. Okay. <laughs> um. So yeah, the conversation points and yeah. So just in terms of maybe whilst we've got a number of members of our community here, just a few points to point out, which is that. Um, there are lots of services which still have availability online. Uh, still availability, sorry, to, to, to come to Shore if that's something that you're comfortable doing. Um, every service on the second day will have a show for blowing. And, and any age is able to come if they feel comfortable and they're able to manage um, the social distancing requirements and the, and the face mask requirements of keeping the place as secure as possible. So even those who are younger than 12, or those who are older than 70. Or those who are older than 70. Every individual. Everyone welcome. is welcome, uh, un, you know, under the understanding that, that this this is this is what it is, that we're trying to keep people as, as risk-free as possible. There's no such thing which is, there's nothing which is risk-free entirely. Everything has a certain level, walking across the road has a certain level of risk. Um, but we invite everyone to come. We're looking into trying to offer outdoor, outdoor or, or personal chauffeur blowing for those that are unable to come to shul but we're not sure following tomorrow's new restrictions whether that's going to be legal or not 
So that is something that we have to come back to the community on in the next couple of days. Um, at any point, do you want to open for questions? Yeah, I was thinking we might yeah. open for questions now. If we have 10 minutes. Is there anything else that you want to kind of, just um, a, a couple of final thoughts? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. We'll have open for questions. We can always Fine. close, close Fine. after. So uh, you now we'd just like to invite anyone who would like to ask a question. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can pop the question into the chat if you like. Um, one easy way to unmute yourself is just to hold down the space bar and then um, whilst that that is a temporary unmuting whilst you're talking and then it can re-mute once you ask your question. You know all these tricks. Well, I've been using Zoom for about six months now, so. So yeah. have I, I don't know any of these tricks. Okay. Anyone? Um, Shoshana? Yeah. Um, I do, hello. Um, I just wondered, and I know time is really tight, um, and not to take away from a, a whole community's requirements, but um, I just wondered if there was anything that could be um, sent to the women's group, just about kind of pointers of things that we, or readings or resources that that we could, well, maybe as a whole community, maybe it doesn't have to just be women, but but um, but something that can a uh, sort of you know some information and guidance or resources would be amazing. Absolutely. The, I think a I'll send I'll send some stuff around. But also I've, I've I just sort of semi organized and contributed to a publication um, or by women for women. But really, I mean everything can be consumed by everyone really. And that should come out in PDF form, and I'll send that out also. And that's a series of women. I think there are 10 of us who, um, who have written an article on something to do with the High Holy Days, but um, just a, a feminine take. Not always a feminine take, but a female voice. So we'll send that round as well. So Perfect. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I think that um, what sometimes we don't realize is that there's so much material so that's much. already out there that is great, you know, that is, uh, you know, is, is, is mind blowing. Yeah. So if maybe we can just put together. I mean, we were a, just reading through through this and there's just such lovely ponder points and such lovely ideas. Yeah. And it's such a small and easy publication. It's all of about it's 10 pages. Yeah. Look at this, like the last the last line. He's talking about three final tips to help you pray. So he, his first tip is say less feel more second tip if at first you don't succeed pray and pray again and the third tip is the more you open up the more you will receive this is really nice so um we'll send around we can send around a list of links that yeah. people can just sort of peruse and, and print out things yeah. at their leisure and i think i think this is a theme that i've really been um pondering over the last few weeks and in a couple of of articles that i've produced for publication over this time period, one that was in this week's JC and one that's coming out is the idea of um, of not have not necessarily having the perfect Rosh Hashanah or the perfect prayer experience or being the perfect person, and that we have to let go of that um, of that expectation of ourselves because that's not necessarily that isn't the ideal. We're not perfect people. We're not going to have a perfect praying experience, and and we have to just just let go of it. We will do what we can do in the way that we can do it, and it's all acceptable to Hashem. And it's so long as you're opening up in some way, we're doing our job. Yeah. No, no, I think the only thing I'd say to that is that yes, you're right that we shouldn't shouldn't have to seek or strive for an image that is unattainable. But let's not. I think there could be a trap this Rosh Hashanah because it's less uh, high key, so to speak, because we're in short for much yeah. less time possibly, to, to just say, sort of, to let it go, to right, let it no, go but by. With the, caveat, with the caveat of, did you try? Right. But did I think, you, did I, you think try? I think that it should be the, our litmus test. Let's all at least try to make this Rosh Hashanah meaningful. Right. You know, to prepare in advance, to get the right things in place, and just to have a go at doing this in a special way. Let's start the conversation, even if you don't feel like it's finished. That's right. Yeah. Started, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? We've obviously answered every single possible question. There you go. It's a good yeah. feeling. No, oh. my parents 
my parents were very, very old fashioned and it was always a family time, Rosh Hashanah, and it was lovely. And my dad, bless him, was a tailor. Always used to make me a new outfit for Rosh Hashanah, always, because it was part of the makeup, if you like. And Rosh Hashanah is lovely. Hmm. Whatever form it takes this yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But actually, actually, that's a, that's a, Sheila. That's that's beautiful, and I think you've raised a beautiful point. Also, there's a there's a very strong custom for people to um, have something new around this time of year for the Chagim period, and for a lot of people that that take the form of a nice piece of clothing. Um, it doesn't have to be clothing. I know my mother is very much of the opinion that everyone should have something nice on their table, and she has this she has this habit of sending to all of her children a small sum of money saying get something really nice whether that's a really nice bottle of wine or a really nice cup of meat or whatever it is have something special that makes it feel like it's a youngster and yeah. I know you know sometimes you can be I know in our house certainly there's been a couple of Shabbatot where I've kind of been like oh it's just going to be such a simple Shabbat I'm putting some salmon in the oven and we're having salmon and salad and that's our Shabbat meal which is okay there's nothing wrong with that I feel no guilt about that no but, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I actually said to him that you know what we're going to get a really buff bottle of wine <laughs> and we're going to get we don't usually eat red meat. We don't really eat meat. But I said, I'm going to get some lamb because it's Rosh Hashanah. We're going to, if we're going to have red meat, we're going to have red meat. <laughs> we're going to do the caveman thing this Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> um, so yeah, Sheila, definitely something special around, around the Chagin makes it feel, makes it feel different. Yeah. We need it this year. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> the wine? Was it something special? <laughs> She's not having I, wine. No, I don't drink wine. <laughs> Suzanne has spoken. <laughs> Sheila is not having wine. It's okay. Oh, oh no, I couldn't do with that. Through the window. <laughs> I got, my mum did once. She actually had cherry brandy. Oh, this thing, we turned around, she's face down. She absolutely went. <laughs> oh, funny time. If there's any other questions as we come to the end of our first hour? No, well, thank you very much, everyone. Such a special, special conversation. We've got to talk to each other for I an know, hour. I, know, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's amazing. Love maps, love maps. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are going to be joined in just a couple of minutes by a very magical fellow. Um, but maybe if anyone wants to have a comfort break now, for just a couple of minutes at six o'clock, we're going to carry on the next part of the evening. Uh, when Ben Levy, will, the mind reader magician, will be joining us for a different way of looking at the world. Thank you, everyone. Clocking off to get the kids. Also,